Thanks, Nicole. Fantastic uh, intro, and um, I love the uh, the other st startup projects. So um, I don't necessarily have any startup projects, but maybe I'll uh, think of one by the end that you can all help me like get up on round sixty seconds. I oh, know I've actually got half an hour, so <laughs> it might be a long sales pitch. Okay, so um, as Nicole said, symmetry is the global theme. This uh, Creative Mornings and uh, initially when I took on this uh, talk I was like oh yeah symmetry you know it's all about this idea of the sort of axial this uh, mirrored idea of symmetry um, so I started looking in a bit more detail about symmetry and so today I'm going to give you a bit of a, a bit of a run crude run through of key concepts around symmetry uh, that I've only recently come across, which are really pretty fascinating. And then I'm looking at that in relation to the disruption of that symmetry. And that applies quite nicely to my practice. And um, although it's not a core theme in terms of how I would articulate what I do, um, there's a really nice synchronicity with that. So uh, I'm going to talk about symmetry um, initially and then the disruption of symmetry and then into intervention, which is principally what I do. I'm a sculptor, um, have training as a visual artist initially and then went back and studied architecture. Um, and so I'll give you a bit more of an insight into that through some of the projects. Um, so three key projects I'll talk about today uh, with an initial intro into symmetry. Okay, so... Symmetry we understand as this, you know, core concept in nature um, where essentially bilaterally symmetry, sym symmetrical through the nose. Um, as you can see, my face is perfectly symmetrical. Um, that's why I'm so attractive to all of you. Um, but actually, when you look a bit uh, carefully, uh, my nose is a little bit off and, you know, there's actually quite a lot of asymmetry uh, with my face and everyone's faces. But... Symmetry is a, a pretty desirable thing. We're all sort of drawn to it. And I think there's these moments in symmetries that alter um, that are really quite interesting. So I'll talk briefly about that. And I'll try and introduce to you some uh, core mathematics principles in relation to group theory. Uh, so I've only just started to get across this. So my mathematics knowledge is, uh, is uh, surface. Uh, we're only putting our toe into this. Uh, and that leads us on to this concept of the monster, which is pretty fascinating in relation to sim the, the biggest symmetrical object that's been discovered, uh, and then that relationship to music. Okay, so we understand the beehive. Uh, there's this hexagonal form with the beehive, which is quintessentially efficient. So there's an efficiency with this geometry that bees innately are drawn to uh, because the way in which that they use the least amount of wax so this symmetry is something that we see through the geometry of the beehive. We also see it in flowers. And we also see with the, the bee's ultraviolet vision that they're drawn to the particular flower uh, in a particular way because of the symmetry and the way in which they're reading the different geometries of the flower. So we see this sort of deep logic in nature around symmetry. Okay, so now this concept of group theory. So... I'll try and explain this to you uh, in a reasonably simple way and then you can all go away today saying that you understand group theory, which is a pretty awesome thing. Um, so if we understand the square and we think about the rotation of a square, so we've got a square that can rotate 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, but it keeps its same state. So we still see it as the square. We can also flip it, reflect it, reflect it on the diagonal and it still retains its same state. And so what we get there is eight permutations or eight different structures of the square, but it still retains the same state. And this is a core concept to this idea around group theory. We also get it with a tetrahedron, which is a triangular pyramid. You can rotate that up to 12 rotations, but it still retains exactly the same form and position. A dodecahedron has a similar idea, but that has 60 rotations. So what we get here is just these quick examples are three uh, different shapes that have a set of rotations. It's like a magic trick. It's like they can rotate, but they are still exactly in the same state. 
And so this was discovered in the um, in the uh, French Revolution by this amazing uh, guy called Galois, who died at 20 uh, because he was uh, had a duel uh, over his love and was shot dead. Uh, but at 18, he discovered this notion of group theory and this idea of these sets of rotations that re were retained. So you get this large table. So there's a vast amount of these. There's like... Um, uh, this is an idea of a periodic table of each of these. And then we move into these other beasts of symmetry. Um, this is called E8. And this is a cousin of uh, what the scientists called in the 80s when they discovered it, the monster. And the monster is an object that has been discovered in maths that has the, the, the most amount of symmetries that there are atoms on the sun. So it has this beastly geometry that is almost unfathomable and so when you dig into symmetry uh, symmetry into um into these core concepts we start to understand it being core to um uh deep physics understanding of black holes and symmetry now is a real foundation of science in terms of understanding how which we exist so that was a mind blower. I had no idea that symmetry was so vast and that these forms become sort of generative in their ideas. Okay, so there's group theory. Do you get it? Good. Okay, so now we're going to jump into music. I said we're just going to dip our toe into this. Um, now, music is a really interesting point and that probably leads me into now talking about my work is that... Uh, Symmetry in music and particularly Bach's uh, Goldberg variations, which is known as a sort of foundation of symmetry in music, um, because Bach tweaked out on this for so long that he has got 30 variations. And as it moves through the piece, he uses reflections. So one whole uh, score is in, in one key and then it's reversed in a mirror on the other side. Then he goes through to these other sets of variations where essentially if you mapped it visually, the variations over the 29, there's 30 in total, the 29 spiral out like an eternal vortex. It's crackers. So he's like basically got the same shape and then he's adding additional notes that's starting to overlay. So he's got multiple mathematical symmetries in this one piece. So that's sort of like showing you how tweaked out you can get with your uh, guitar playing in the, uh, you know, the cafe. You can pull out the ultimate symmetry, <coughs> which I don't think I've tapped into with my terrible guitar playing. But um, you can see here that the symmetry on these pieces are vast. But the interesting point to bring up with Bach is that although he's got this ultimate symmetry through the whole... 29 variations that you would seem like at the end he would take you back to the beginning point as though there's this sort of ultimate reflectivity. He then just drops the whole project and then on the 30th variation he introduces a folk tune and so the, the final variation essentially just disregards and throws away all the symmetry. So there's this sort of comic uh, and at the time when people are understanding this in the 1700s, this would have just been crazy to do this. But I think it shows that there's these points of control and there's this potential for rupture. So that's a really nice jump point now for me to talk into uh, this first project. So that's giving you a whip around of symmetry, but I could not do this talk without sort of unpacking that. And I think it gives you a really pretty wonderful uh, idea that symmetry is much vaster than this idea of the reflective uh, understanding that we think symmetry is. Okay, so I've just talked through this idea of the rupture, right? So for me, as I said, I trained as an architect and an artist, but I, I left school uh, and went straight into visual arts. I come from a family of architects. My dad's here and mum as well. Hi. Dad will uh, talk to you all day uh, after, so... Um, and uh, he's an architect, he's 
dad is an architect, my brother's an architect, my sister's an architect. And this was like quite a heavy load for me to say, ah, you've got to do architecture. Um, that's my dad speaking. <laughs> no, never said that, Michael Fox. Um, <clears throat> and so great you came here, Dad. I can just like keep uh, jabbing you all day. Um, <clears throat> and for me to then do visual arts was a big... Uh, jump and so then I practiced for about 10 years being an artist and then went back at sort of 28 30 and started architecture and then following that have continued with my visual arts practice but always dabbled in practicing in an architect and now my practice is really combining the both but this project is uh, an idea about drawing this is quite recent this is 2015 to 2018 and it starts a new body of work for me uh, I've done quite a lot of uh, object making for m most of the career, uh, but this project is specifically drawing, and it sort of talks about this, this testing of control and this idea of the symmetry and then the rupture or the break. So all I did is I set out to um, map my movement. So this project looks at my movement as I sort of twist around. I do a series of drawings which map that. And these started to develop an understanding of just a really simple movement of my arms swinging around. And this became, just like we talked about with symmetry, a set of rules or a set of structures. And that does form a basis of the work I make. I generally set up these structures or rules or systems uh, and then try and break them or try and rupture them or pivot off them. So once I developed through these drawings, I had a jump point where... I then made a drawing from memory of the movement. So this is my sort of expressive drawing of that movement after doing analytical drawings. Then back into mapping over that and then generating that into a brazed object. And so this became a sort of quite structured process of sort of generating form out of movement. But the big movement for me was then to think, okay, well, I've made this lovely appealing thing, that's great, but how can I then push it? So then I thought, well, why don't I just pick up and start to draw with it again? So it became a sort of augmentation of my body or a rupture of that. So I started to look at picking it up and using it. And so this then becomes, can we get some sound on this? Um, this then becomes a process of me uh, working through it. So you can get a sense here of, uh, I was imagining I was much more athletic um, than, I, than I thought I was once I started this project. So this became pretty exhausting. Um, yeah, so as it, as it sort of proceeds, you get a sense of that uh, struggle with it. Uh, so this produced a series of drawings um, and the object began... Uh, is then exhibited as this sort of uh, rarefied art object. So interesting in the first iteration. But for me, that was just one part of this project. It was then about going back and taking that same object and then augmenting it again and then making it into a uh, larger appendage, this uh, thing that is sort of flaccid um, yet potent, um, but it was interesting because for me it's about this struggle between my uh, earnest intent to control the drawing but yet this uh, sort of decay of the mark and so uh, it becomes this sort of physical struggle and, and for me was a really lovely way of opening up this conversation between uh, the two parts of me, this idea of ultimate control and the architectural mind and this sort of more abandoned uh, freeform uh, experimentation and exploration in art practice. So 
this idea around the symmetry and the break sort of starts to tie nicely into this notion. So these are some of the some of the versions of it. And then we get another iteration here where I'm then hanging um, uh, as a sort of, uh, I could do the impersonations again. And then, then it, it's the bashing, uh, which is, uh, got to say, so, <laughs> yep. So yeah, I can just, can you guys see okay then? Um, so you can see there's this sort of, uh, uh, this connection with the the body and the connection to the mark making, but I've sort of constructed this incredibly um, uh, vast object to to try and distort or change that relationship to the mark. And um, the sort of fail, the failing of it is is the part that's uh, probably the most interesting, and the and the the missing of the wall uh, and so on. So we get this. Uh, again, this one was the most exhausting. That really sucked. That one. Um, and then we get the the object left and this sort of tracing of that mark. Okay, so that's sort of showing you a really li nice connection with um, symmetry in relation to this drawing project that's been ongoing. Um, and now I'll take you through a, a, a recent exhibition that I curated, um, and that's not normal for me to be doing curatorial uh, work. Generally, I'm exhibiting my own practice, but um, as part of my job at uh, Sydney Uni, where I teach the first year architecture students, I run the first year program there, but I give them an opportunity to think exploratory in relation to their uh, architectural uh, study. This was an exhibition that tracked 100 years of the architecture faculty at Sydney Uni. So I collaborated um, with Yakov um, Amperidis, who is, works at Tin Sheds Gallery. And we looked across the archive and found this amazing amount of stuff. This is an image from the 60s, which is a hyperbolic paraboloid, um, which is this twisting form that was developed from the architectural kids um, and they were testing this idea of surface and geometry. So it has an incredibly contemporary feel, this image. So I thought, okay, that's a really inspiring motivation for p p language that we could look at for the way we could approach the show. But that was only half of it. The main idea was to try and understand the, the content of this 100 years, which is a pretty vast thing to take on. And to, to think about... Uh, 100 years of a faculty really became about a set of rules. So again, we look at this symmetrical rule or this idea of a, uh, a detailed structure. So we simply mapped all of the different dates and how many items that we had that related to those dates. A sort of simple Excel that sort of it was this vast amount of data. Uh, and then we started to deploy that across the space. So we used a Hilbert curve, which is essentially a curve, which is hard to read in this image, but it's essentially a snaking curve, which moves all the way across the space. And that was a way of plotting each of the dates in relation to uh, a moment in space, but also a moment in time. That then in sort of informed these sort of clusters, which you can just make out here. Uh, and that started to inform then where certain parts of the content would go. So we developed through that in a really sort of systematic way, but then there was a clear jump point when we started to look at geometry and looking at how that could actually start to work in uh, sizes, in three dimensions, uh, and how that would then move across into the different layers of the, the gallery. So what that starts to show here is different date fields and different areas of the 70s and earlier on into the, into the 30s and 40s and then back around into current day. So this is then what the exhibition starts to look like. Um, you know, it's a large sort of folded form out of aluminium and each of these points are plotted in space in relation to the date and then the aluminium then moves between it. So just showing you this project to uh, talk about in my practice this jump of um, rule systems or rule structures and then the actual uh, jumping out of that. And for this project, 
uh, and like many, when you're building things, the logistics and, and complexity of trying to understand how to put these things together brings its own set of compromises and, and complexities that you have to sort of include into that. So I think it's about an agility with it, uh, but there's also an idea of staying true to that sort of core through line for each of the different projects. Okay, so that's the Centenary Exhibition. Just a quick one to give you a taster before the main event, uh, which you're all here for. It's like um, when you play the music. And, uh, can you just play the, like, the song that everyone wants to see? Okay, Winyard Station. Um, now, but this project for me, um, I do love talking about it because it is a... Um, for me, I think it, I just had such wonderful flow with it and that doesn't usually happen with projects. Often um, projects come about uh, and they're quite challenging to start off with. Uh, this one was a, a really quite special one. Uh, <coughs> I remember I got called in the end of 2016 and uh, we'd just given birth to my son um, two weeks before. So it was... Uh, um, we were all pretty frazzled, not a lot of sleep. And one of the art consultants who I know, um, Harry Partridge, called me up and said, oh, Chris, I uh, just wanted to call. How are you going? What are you up to? You know, I've got a great project. Would you be interested? Oh, look, Harry, terrible time. I haven't slept. Uh, end of the year, it's Christmas Eve. And, uh, you know, we just Lewis has just been born and there's no way I can take on anything. Oh, cool. But I'll just tell you about it. It's this big... Uh, public commission at Wynyard Station where you can use all the escalators of the old Wynyard Timber Escalator. I'm like, oh, I'm totally available. That's fine. I can take it. No, it's fine. I sleep, 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 whatever. Um, and from there, strangely enough, from that first call, um, I actually had some sort of vision of the work. Maybe it was the sleep depth um, and this, uh, the screaming kid, but... Um, it was actually something about this sort of floating volume and I could sort of, I knew the escalators quite well and I could sort of imagine them in, in the ceiling or in the space or sort of snaking around. That's, I, don't, I didn't recall exactly the form, but that was a very acute moment to have that sort of uh, vision so early on. So, so the project, uh, as you well know, is uh, in Wynyard Station um, and is uh, at the York Street escalators. So it looks at reusing the timber escalators um, and reinserting them in the uh, Wynyard Station. And so the Wynyard Station went for, with a large upgrade uh, and these look at reusing these key pieces. And we can see here the, um, the pieces at the top, uh, the old comb plates, uh, which are reinserted, uh, and we can see the alignment um, or the symmetry that that aligns to the new escalators and the old escalator transition. So there's a there's a clear definition between those two. Um, so Wynyard escalators were uh, installed in 1932, uh, 31, sorry, but opened in 1932. So and this is a pretty amazing time in the city. Harbour Bridge just opened at this point. And um, there's a pretty interesting point where uh, the city was changing. There was a new underground. Um, also, this is off the back of the Depression. So, uh, pretty difficult time uh, during that period. So, seeing the city change like this was pretty uh, inspiring, I think, for the city. And uh, these became a pretty iconic moment for Sydney and have been a big part of the city since 32. So 85 years they were in service um, and really made a really wonderful impact in the city and uh, brought this idea of uh, uh, connection from the subterranean to the upper levels and that's where the escalator came about. This is one of the longest escalators at the time when it was first installed. Um, and then the tube also had a whole lot of escalators that were um, about the same sort of length. But this really, in Bradfield's design, who you would know from the bridge, he also designed this underground. And he brought the concept of the escalators to Sydney as this notion of how can we move the large volumes of people up to the surface. So it sort of was representing of technology, representing of urban planning um, and, and the change of the city. So these were in operation till 
2017. Uh, and here we are um, on the last few days when they're starting to upgrade Wynyard Station. So um, the station went for a full upgrade. You would know the Wynyard Walk perhaps over to Barangaroo. All of that happened during the same period. Um, and in the lead up to this uh, renovation and, and upgrade, uh, the Heritage team were really determined to do something with these treads. So prior to me getting that call uh, end of 2016, there was a lot of lobbying that happened for a couple of years before where they were like, we've got to do something with these escalators. And from that, they looked at a heritage interpretation uh, and jumping from that to that call, uh, they asked three artists to pitch uh, to do something with these amazing infrastructure. And we could use anything of them at all, uh, and we could uh, put them wherever we wanted. Initially, they wanted us to put them up the side walls, uh, but I just kept going back with this sort of large sculptural project, and uh, somehow they said yes. So this is the project. This is the sketches um, that happened over Christmas. Uh, I think this was due the 10th of January, after all that insane timing. So difficult time to pull out a proposal but again I think from the outset I really knew what the project uh, was and you can see here uh, the symmetry of the previous escalators and then the reinstated new escalators and then this rotation that happens this flipping around so these really simple sketches start to show uh, the core concept um, and these were pretty quick hand sketches, which is quite rare. Normally I'm doing these quite elaborate uh, renderings of, of the project, but for this project, uh, I just kept pushing through with these hand drawings because I think the, the concept was pretty simple. This idea of interlooping a uh, set of stairs, this idea of connecting past and future journeys. So here we go, a plan, understanding how that's fitting in the space, which was, very complicated to understand um, and working through some 3D models. This is from one of the team that I work and Gabe's here today from Armour. Um, so I work with a really fantastic team. Um, also uh, Sasha uh, Bollinger from uh, Bollinger Gronum, uh, engineers uh, and a whole lot of different team and specialists that work through developing this project. So this is what we came up with. We came up with this central spine a tube that was connected between these different points of the building. Uh, that seemed pretty straightforward. It would be the main structural load for the cantilever between the different points. Uh, and then they would, we would attach the treads to that central pipe. That all seemed pretty straightforward and awesome. Uh, and then transport came back and said, no, you've only got 48 hours to install it. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so from... Two and a half weeks, which was in the contract, they said, no, you've only got 48 hours to build this. Uh, so we had to completely change the design. There's no way this project would have been able to be installed in that sort of rapid time. So we had to rethink how we were designing it really from the ground up. So we looked at another structure, um, which was essentially an aluminium box section that the treads would then get attached to it. So this structure then became the basis of how we were going to build it. That Essentially, no longer was there a central pipe. Uh, we looked at this an accordion aluminium structure uh, that was prefabricated into these separate elements, uh, and then that would all get bolted together on site. So we had to then do sort of detailed finite element analysis, which principally means just testing the stress of the material. As you can see here, when it's red, it's not good. Um, but it, that's relative, right? Not goods only, I think, uh, seven mil. So it's fine. Um, it's totally safe to go there. Although I only just took my son there last week because I think it's, it's been two years now. It's <laughs> but it, now that I've gone with Lewis, it's totally fine. It's like the defects period is over. Um, so here we go, the central uh, connections between... Um, this is sort of the way in which we understood the structure and we thought about these quite tricky details about connecting between the two elements as this sort of structural connection, uh, connecting back to the base building. Then each of the details that we worked up were, um, each of the different items were um, detailed and um, drawn and documented so that we could output that straight to the factory floor. So there was uh, streamlining through the workflow that we not only developed up 
um, the shape and form of it, but we also had a series of jigs that then were allowing for that to be built on the workshop. So here we go. We've got the workshop. Um, oh, it's okay. We don't need sound. That's right. Um, this is uh, at the workshop floor and uh, folding each of the elements up and then welding this together. So about a kilometre of welding, this project was pretty vast. Um, and interesting just working with fabricators. Uh, these are uh, specialist boat builders up in Brisbane uh, who I've worked with quite a lot. Uh, with these large-scale projects and um, really fantastic the way in which they work with the material. Particularly this detail here where it's doubly curved. Uh, remember I showed you that hyperbolic paraboloid structure? That's a, again a doubly curved surface and in fabrication terms doubly curved surfaces are pretty complicated and expensive if you're trying to do it out of sheet material. Um, and we spent so long trying to work it out, like there's no way we can't, we're going to have to facet it or we could radius it off, maybe we could 3D print it, maybe we could um, get a six-axis robot and the fabricator's like, no, no, you just push it. <laughs> and so they just pushed it and what was <laughs> good was that they just pushed all the metal into those positions. These are all perfectly radius, but the outer skin, they just basically work at like a, a light gauge uh, timber sheet. So pretty pretty interesting working with material like that. And the way in which that we did the pre-build uh, was thought through in terms of how we we're going to ship it and then how we we're going to get it to site. We also thought about all the lifting points in Windu Station going back to the 48 hour debacle. We had to rethink about how we're going to install this in each of the different moments. So. This is us coming down George Street. Um, we just went to uh, Ivy um, and then the crew then were on tools. Um, <coughs> no, but it's a no, no drinking policy across the... So it was pretty intense. You couldn't... There was nothing. Nothing. <laughs> I swear. I swear. Uh, so this is us attaching each of the treads. Uh, and then remember those lifting points? They were then lifted up uh, and then positioned with the crew. Uh, to make sure that we could get each of the different elements in position um, and then bolted together in the sections. So uh, even just getting the pieces down there was difficult. There was this very tight access from George Street, so every size of every piece had to be clearing. This one sprinkler was at 2100 high. It was pretty crackers. Um, but each of the pieces came in and then were hoisted up in position. So we get a sense here... Um, with a time lapse of construction, this is the fabrication in the workshop. As you can see, the jigs go out, then the folded pieces lay out, and then they start working on the side panels and then assembling the pre build. So, the pre build essentially makes sure we pick up all those points uh, in the location, and then the install from the Friday night, uh, then scaffold goes up to block the escalators. The lifting chain gets connected to those pre-installed lifting points in the ceiling and then we start installing each of these elements. Uh, and even on the install, the first arm that went in on the far left uh, was out by quite a fair way. It was about 170 mil out, which is diabolical because the tolerance on the project was about 8 mil. Um, so uh, everyone was like, it's not going to fit, it's not going to fit, we're not going to be able to do it. Um, and at that point, really, it was just about working with the material. I said, just sit on it. And the guy's like, no, we can't sit on it. And we just literally just had to sit on it and then put the, um, the, the podger in, which is the connection before the bolt connection. And it's funny that even though there's so much precision with this, the natural deflection and movement of material, such as this big span, uh, there's so much movement around that, that until you bolt it all together and stiffen it up, uh, there's quite a lot of movement. Once we understood how to lift it, um, then the rest went in pretty well. So here we are on the morning uh, of the 4th of December, 2017. And this is pretty fantastic being here. So I was here with the photographers documenting this. Uh, escalators opened uh, after being closed at 11 at night uh, on the Friday and seeing people walk past uh, was hilarious because uh, a lot of people are just on their phone zombieing up and then occasionally they'd look up and then and go, I swear that wasn't there on Friday. <laughs> um, so there was this quite uncanny thing where people I think uh, firstly had no idea it was coming um, 
and also had this really amazing uh, uh, reveal of this project because there was no press about it, which was great, and we just built it. And then, particularly because we did that very sharp install, it meant that it just arrived in the city. And from that moment, it's been overwhelming, the response. And I think people have had a really sort of fantastic connection with it. And I think there's something about the legacy of this being 85 years in service so there's this sort of material memory in those treads that people are have an incredible affinity with so to be able to work with that was so potent and I think that there's something um, also about um, coming back full circle now back to symmetry is that there's there's something that's so familiar with this but there's something otherworldly or something that has shifted and I think there's that really incredible uh, connection that people have about something that's very familiar that they have a connection with, but that something's being shifted or distorted. And I think for me, that's really what this project in, encompasses and talks about that idea around breaking the rules and breaking the symmetry. And that's my talk. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Chris. That was incredible, amazing, so informative and um, so inspiring as well. So, guys, we're going to do a quick Q&A. Um, if anyone does need to run off to work, that is absolutely fine, but just be very quiet. Um, so, I've got the mic, so I'm going to start with the first question. And, you know, you talked about the idea for Interloop came when you were sleep deprived and, you know, maybe that was what helped with the inspiration. But I'm so curious as you know, when you're not sleep deprived and you don't just get a flash, what do you do to get your ideas? Are you um, actively looking at certain things to get ideas? Do you travel? Do you like, what? where do you get your ideas and what do you do to actively go about getting inspiration? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, with this particular project, like I mentioned, there was that uh, very acute moment, but actually 90% of the time that just doesn't happen. It's like hard slog of just like working at it. And I think uh, with most of you being creatives in the room, um, I would imagine you would find the same thing, that it's essentially back to the core of the talk, which is about this sort of set of rules or set of structures. That's the, that's really my core approach. So new proposal comes in, um, I understand the site, understand the conditions, and then I start to structure Firstly, things that I'm drawn to, uh, but then I would sort of pull apart um, and build a sort of framework. So there'll be some inspiration that either comes firstly from the site or from the sort of context of the project. Um, but often it's just about setting up a framework of iterating. And um, that could be really simple as a form generating thing, or it could be something that's more research based. Um, so it could be in relation to like I showed you with the centenary project, just a really uh, simple idea of mapping the data and the data itself starts to then help something emerge. Um, and I think emergence or um, generative process is a, a core sort of guiding principle that I generally try and follow. Um, because I think it's important as a creative to not expect that you're just going to come up with an amazing new project. You know, that's, uh, that's anxiety driving. Um, and so I think you just got to wake up and just get to work and just drive through it because, um, and even after this uh, really wonderful push through that this project's had, I still try and stay steady with this idea of just trying to produce excellent work and um, steadily work at it. And I think sustained engagement is essentially the trick with that. Okay, yep. Hi, man. All right. Okay. So, did everyone hear that? I'll just repeat briefly. Like, what were the? Um, uh, I'm going to try and paraphrase your question. Yeah. What is there a core geometry, or is there a core uh, sort of generative approach? Um, I'll talk to you first. So, um, for a long time, I was pretty obsessed with pipes. 
um, and I did a lot of work with these sort of sinewy form. So that was something that was in my practice for a while. Uh, and prior to that, I was w- working with a sort of geometry uh, which is more fractured and deconstructed. So there's definitely been periods where I've had uh, obsessive uh, material um, uh, threads through the practice. But now I think I, tr- I specifically try and be agile with that. And so... Uh, try and be open to new processes, new um, ways of thinking. Um, and I think the initial approach, I uh, try and be as divergent as possible because I just, uh, I then sort of uh, just try and be steady with my instinct to know how to then then shape it or do that break point. Um, because it's in, inherently, I think I got a, I've got a sense of what I want to do, um, but I like actually creating it as a, a broader form. But um, I think if you track over the different works in my projects, you'll in the practice, you'll see threads. But I try not to be so deliberate with that. But yeah, it's a roundabout answer, I suppose. But uh, and then the forty-eight hours. No, we were actually pretty good. We, um, I think we finished at about five p.m. on the Sunday. So then we had engineering sign off about 8 p.m. Um, yeah, and they kept saying, you've got to get off site. You haven't slept again. You've got to go off site. Um, but the team that we had, we had sort of alternating shifts. So I, uh, essentially, we was just nonstop work from 11 p.m. through to about 5 p.m., which was hilarious when they first said, you've got 48 hours. All the rail contractors said, yeah, that's like a week. I'm like, what? It's like, no, there's like a week of hours. In a weekend, I'm like, that's the worst thing you've ever said. <laughs> so don't, yeah, don't think that that's a good thing to work that much. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Um, you mentioned that you also teach the first year. Yep. How are the kids? How are they? Yeah, well, how do you feel about them? Is anything, like, cool that you see? Um, so just asking about how are the students in first year architecture? Um, yeah, it's a changing, it's a changing uh, demographic, it's a changing uh, cultural set. Um, but I mean, I think the course that we teach, they're all really engaged. They're they're super uh, super sharp kids, um, and the students are really uh, terrified, to be honest. <laughs> once we start, um, but I think uh, yeah, there's an earnest engagement. I think. Uh, perhaps I can just talk to briefly like, our general approach. I think everyone goes to architecture schools to design their dream house. Um, not everyone, but most first year students do. Uh, and we pretty much break that straight off the bat where they're, they're doing very similar to what I did for my uh, drawing project where they're mapping the body and then generating a form out of that. So we're doing this quite experimental work. But um, yeah, I mean, I think... There's uh, universities changed quite a lot over these last 15 years. We're seeing a, a different cohort coming through. Uh, connection back to industry is much more intense, uh, and universities are uh, a vast beast now. They're an industry. Um, education is a big export. So, yeah, so it's a changing place to teach in, but it, yeah, it's inspiring. It's good. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I mean, generally, contractually, the the end dates are always pretty much confirmed, um, and this one was no different. But uh, for me, it was uh, I had a bit of a wedge once they pulled the forty eight hour call because the contract had said two and a half weeks, so I was able to sneak another month. Uh, I think my initial date was going to be November the fourth, and I got another month added. Um, but once we got to the end, because they were trying to close out the whole station. Um, yeah, those things are pretty fixed. And so damages occur if you're late. And and that's generally how I run these projects. I, I've got my own business and I run the, the whole project, which means that I'm liable for it. So it's, it's a big load, but I love that complexity of the project, that I'm the artist, the designer, the documenting, the involved in the engineering, uh, and then the project manager and then the builder. So um, having that vast sort of scope in the practice um, – it's sort of pulling on all those skills, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Are we done? Um, okay. Well, I'm going to ask one more thing. Okay. Um, 
So I'd just like to know what's next or is there something you're currently working on that you want to share with us or just any kind of big goals or dreams that you have for yourself? Um, okay, big question, yeah. No, there's definitely quite a few projects happening. Um, a big one that will probably go to press in another month or so, so you guys will hopefully hear about that. And well, I can say at this point it's a pavilion project, so that's a really exciting project that is a sort of combination of uh, an artwork, a sculptural uh, entity but also has program that people are actually inhabiting so that's super exciting uh, to be working on that um, and a few other bits and pieces that I'm working on uh, other sort of uh, pictures and and projects that keep coming up and so yeah I think that's probably about it All right. um, guys please give Chris a huge round of applause that was awesome thank you so much <laughs>